today I'm going to talk to you um, about adjunctive orthodontics in your general practice. Um, this also applies to orthodontics as well, but uh, this is a, um, a version of a lecture that I give to the third and uh, year dental students as they're in the clinic there. So it's a some spring semester kind of clinical uh, topic. So, um, and I don't expect you're going to be um, an expert at orthodontics from this, but I do hope that it sheds some light on possibilities as you think about your restorative um, situations with patients that you have. And uh, I'm kind of think about like in this topic that orthodontics is kind of secondary. So um, I think in terms of how this all plays out, it's really driven by the restorative dentist. So, um, and what I hope, see if this works. Uh, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to give you a definition of adjunctive orthodontic treatment. We'll talk a little bit about uh, why limited treatment is appropriate and when it should be used. Um, I'll give you some diagnostic information and some mechanical kind of considerations to think about. And then I'm going to go through the four most common situations that um, arise in our clinic and in private practice. In uh, my previous uh, life, I did practice general dentistry before I did ortho. So um, I'll give you that. Our reference is the uh, um, famous book, you know, the profit book um, with um, Dr. Larson's underline because he's a chairman at Minnesota and he's um, one of the co-editors. So, all right. Um, I hope that after you um, listen to this, like I said, you'll have a good understanding and be able to communicate um, both with the patient and with your orthodontist if you're going to have them do the treatment, um, what you're going to try to achieve or what you would like them to achieve. Um, I'm hoping that you can understand how this is a cooperative kind of part of dentistry and um, how we need the general dentist um, to lead this or the, really the restorative person to do that. And like I said, I'll give you some indications and mechanics for um, these specific situations of molar upright cross bite correction, forced eruption, and some uh, minor alignment for doing restorative kind of treatment. And part of it is also to let you know that you know, I think these kind of CE are critical, even though you, you never touch an ortho wire, but you really can't diagnose or treat something that you don't know anything about. And I found through the years that our patients suffer if we don't know that. So, okay, so what is the adjunctive orthodontics? It's usually a um, minor tooth movement carried out to facilitate some other treatment. And that is either you want to try to um, enhance periodontal cleaning, uh, you want to facilitate, you know, restorations, um, you want to try to restore some functions. So um, you would like to have, for example, get a favorable crown to root ratio for some teeth, or you want to have um, forces that are along the long axis of certain teeth. Um, it usually is involved with partial braces or partial appliances. Um, and it's the key is it's a short duration of time. It's not going to be something that we want to have patients in for uh, years, certainly. So I always think about like nine, 12 months is the max. And ideally shorter than that would be um, more appropriate. It's going to have very limited goals. So this is not something that you're trying to get perfection. You're just trying to improve. Um, you're just trying to improve things in a localized area, and it is multidisciplinary. So it's like I said, driven really by the restorative person, and um, that person has to be a good communicator and tell either orthodontist or they have to be a good um, communicator to uh, relay to the patient what exactly is going to be expected from this kind of limited. Uh, this is just a little example to kind of whet your 
taste buds. There is a the lecture has a bunch of written slides in the beginning, but we will get some clinical. So this is a case where we were doing some forced eruption, and um, it was a broken um, molar and lingual cusp. So it was pre-prosthetic. We could save the tooth, um, avoid the cost of an implant. Um, sometimes we also do uh, these kind of procedures. Um, for subgingival caries. Um, and also you can think about it in terms of orthodontic extraction. So if you go um, and extract or you know, orthodontically move a tooth out of bone in this eruption kind of pattern, it will bring the bone with it. So lots of times it's helpful in terms of implant placement, saving patients um, cost and uh, surgical procedures for implants. Um, so those are all possibilities, and sometimes we people have asked me in the past, students like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just take it out and put the bone graft or do you know, some of those other procedures? And sometimes it's um, because of the nature of the patient age, it's much easier to um, do something like this. So comprehensive treatment really looks at all possibilities. That's our goal, and sometimes um, it's important to think about what adjunctive treatment is not, okay? So um, it's not going to be comprehensive. I don't feel adjunctive treatment's appropriate, like a second stage if you're treating a TMJ patient and now you're going to try to fix their bite. That's really comprehensive kind of treatment. I think of intrusion of teeth is really comprehensive treatment. It takes a lot of forces and biomechanics. It takes a lot of hardware to do that well. Um, and I would say if you're doing Invisalign and you're doing more than like four millimeters of IPR, um, especially on lower incisors, that's probably a case that's really in the realm of comprehensive um, treatment. Most of our adult treatments are going to be um, divided up, you can think about, into younger and older adults. Um, we would like to think of, you know, the fact that if you're going to do adjunctive treatment on um, younger adults, 18 to 21, they're usually for fractured teeth and those kind of things. Um, so there's no growth concerns there. Okay. Um, if you have younger adults, 21 to 40, um, prior to stethotomy, all things may change, of course, but um, they, in general, are more interested in getting comprehensive kind of treatment. So that age range is important to keep in mind as you um, have patients come through your practices. Um, they're, they're looking for maximum improvement. That's been my experience and the experience of our um, faculty in our practice at the U. Um, older patients, however, once you get into the you know, mid 40s and older, they're just really, their goal is to maintain what they have. So adjunctive treatments really um, very appropriate for that age group. Um, and that's the other reason to think about keeping kind of shorter treatment time. Um, I would say that if I look back at my career, some of the biggest mistakes we've made is because we did not have adequate records. Um, just because it's a uh, limited treatment doesn't follow that you're going to have limited records. You really need comprehensive records. Um, primarily because you're trying to control one aspect of movement and um, you also need a way to communicate with um, the other people on the team who, you know, the periodontist or the prosthodontist. So it just makes more sense to be very comprehensive about that. Um, I always tell the students also that the um, number one uh, reason orthodontists get sued is because of periodontal issues. So um, having a clear list of the patient's problems and being um, very realistic rather than idealistic of what's going to be accomplished is hugely, hugely important. Okay? Um, and I think the other major thing is the communication between the people you work with. So if you're used to working with a certain orthodontist, that's the person you should work with on the um, orthodontic 
portion. If you want to do it yourself, you certainly can. Uh, just try to be very careful about your limitations and what you're going to be able to promise them and do for them. And I'll try to point some of those uh, pitfalls, potential pitfalls out as I go through this. Um, so I would say comprehensive records should include, you know, a thorough exam. Um, it'd be nice if you could do photos. Um, uh, if you could do an intraoral scan, you should have both arches, not just quadrant kind of thing, even though you may work in the quadrant. Certainly, um, if you have a comb beam or um, CBCT capabilities, that would be appropriate. Um, you definitely want to confirm that you don't have any active periodontal disease and you have all caries arrested. Doesn't mean that they have to have final uh, restorations, but at least you have things kind of um, doable so that you can get into some partial braces or partial appliances for six months six months to nine months without things going south on you. Um, and then it's very helpful, especially you're doing PROS to have mounted models. Um, you'll see, I will make a point about equilibrating uh, molars, especially if you're uprighting those, that's going to be um, helpful to have those mounted models so you have some reference point kind of before you started this whole thing. Um, and records, like I said, it'll include, in my practice, we did uh, mounted models. We used a baseball, um, took a CR bite. Um, we would request, uh, when I was requested to do things, we would ask the uh, general dentist to take PA x-rays. I did not have uh, that as a capability. Um, we had a CBCT, so um, in the treatment sequence is an important concept to kind of think about as well. Um, you're, as the restorative person, you're going to have the very, um, like the big picture, and you're going to subcontract out for these other procedures. So that's kind of how I think about it. And um, you know, after you get the stage one, your disease control, you got some caries and perio, then you're gonna reevaluate. And sometimes some of those things, as we all know, don't work out quite the way we want, or you decide it's just not worth salvaging that tooth and you're gonna have some other teeth taken out. Um, and you can establish in stage two there, what kind of occlusion you're aiming to achieve. And that's really where orthodontics will come in. Once you uh, complete that, portion, then you want to stabilize everything. And usually you're going to stabilize things for a couple months. It allows those tissues and um, bone to kind of catch up to the movements because most of the movements are going to be um, shorter term. And so they're relatively rapid. Um, and then once that's all stabilized, you can go ahead and do your perio restorative kind of treatment. And at that point afterwards, um, some sort of retention plan. Okay. So and maintain things. Uh, force considerations are an important thing to think about when you're doing limited treatment. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of force, as you can see there, to tip teeth. So um, that's how aligners work. So that works well for um, some of the movements. If you're going to do bodily movement, and this is going to get into moving molars, you're gonna need a lot more force. So everybody can see that. Um, and that means you're gonna need a lot more anchorage. And we'll get talking about that. Um, uprighting is right up there. Those are two heavy force kind of movements to make. Um, rotating teeth to, you know, if you have an upper incisor or you want an alignment, those are pretty light forces. You're gonna be able to do that relatively easy. Um, extrusion is also a light force. And intrusion is a light force. So if you're trying to intrude things, you don't need a ton of force, but it's a hard force to control. So um, we'll talk about that. And that is, if you're trying to do this, even with aligners, you would think like you're able to cup that whole crown, but things kind of tend to get off whack a little bit. So they're going to end up tipping on you, and that's part of the problem. Like, how do you control that? tipping so that you maintain this alignment or parallel um, tooth alignment that you have. So 
you can do it with aligners, but a lot of times if you're gonna end up doing restorative or the tooth's broken down, it makes it really, really tough. My experience has been, um, and this comes up in the clinic all the time, you know, a couple of in your practice, right? So if you're going to restore that tooth, and, but to move it, you're gonna need more of a crown. You may end up doing a um, composite restoration on it initially to help get it in place, and then you'll have to replace that with you know a fixed crown. So um, try to keep that in the back of your mind that that can help you a lot. Um, and then you also want to think about periodontal issues and how those, um, if you've lost some um, bone, you're going to end up increasing the forces. So this gets into that uh, anchorage kind of thing, and you in limited treatment really would like most of the time to be on the bottom here with doing compound kind of anchorage. That means you're pitting as in a tug of war, you want as many people on your side and at least amount of people on the tooth or the single person you're trying to move on the other side. So that's how you can think about it. Simple is um, if you did just a simple diastema closure in the anterior, so say you were going to bring, you know, the two centrals together, and um, I have a case towards the end where we did that, and you'll um, just really pit one tooth against the other. Everything's on in terms of midline, so it's pretty symmetric. So um, that's simple. But molar upwriting and those kind of procedures where you're going to extrude teeth or try to intrude teeth, you're going to need multiple teeth to help brace and uh, work against that one tooth. So that's gonna be compound. Mechanical considerations. So in the United States, uh, across the world, there's really two basic appliance systems. There are 22 thousandths of a slot and 18 thousandths of a slot. And when you're doing limited treatment, I have found that 22 slot um, is a better appliance. It gives you more we say slop in the slot. That means you don't have to use a full 22 size arch wire, but you can use something less. If you use an 18 slot, the wire size to not fill that slot is gonna be quite a bit smaller. So that becomes part of the anchorage problem. Um, aligner therapy is wonderful when you're doing certain procedures um, because you can program into the aligner. You can let the aligner um, company of your choice let them know that you don't want to move anything but that one tooth. So that's a very nice way to do it. Removal of appliances like uh, retainers and things like that, they're a little um, very limited. I, I would say the um, possibilities of using those are going to be pretty limited in your careers. Um, you will have instances where you can do it, but it's not going to be very often. Um, those are well designed if they're um, pitting just one tooth against it. So, for example, if you have um, a patient and you're going to pit a, an upper incisor in a crossbite kind of pattern, that's always um, the classic retainer kind of mode. So, and I'll show you some examples of that. So when you're thinking about bonding the lower and you're gonna pit this to upright that molar, um, A shows you know, perfect placement of the brackets, okay? That's really not what you're trying to achieve. So you know, on this patient who's you know, 40 or 50 years old and you just wanna upright that molar so you can get some space there for an implant or something like that, you really want to just leave those um, lower cuspids and bicuspids where they are. There'll be a stable anchorage unit, if that makes sense. And like the horizontal line that's going through the braces, you can put in a nice stiff wire. So in a 22 slot system, you should um, be able to get into a 1925 stainless steel wire from the get-go. And that would give you that, uh, anchor unit to um, be able to counter that molar. So if you're starting to upright that molar, you're gonna have this intrusion force on the bicuspid through the cuspid. So that's what you're trying to counter. Um, if you're gonna be doing upper um, 
treatment and you have peritoneal um, loss, you also want to consider the fact that the force level um, is going to be much higher. So you got less bone, and so uh, the force level you can see there when they figure it all out, it's the difference between you know 2,000 grams per milliliter and 24 grams. And you may not think that's much, but it's like 20% more. So it can be detrimental to the not only to the tooth in terms of causing root resorption, but it can be also detrimental to the um, periodontal tissue. Like that's just too much compression for it. So let's move into, uh, with that little background, let's move into the classic um, missing molar. Um, anybody who's practiced general dentistry has seen this a gazillion times. The first molar is the most um, common missing tooth, right? It comes into our head when we're like six or seven, um, gets beat up pretty well, and then um, for a number of reasons, um, patients lose those molars. So then you're faced with this situation where you have molars tipped and um, you're trying to restore these um, occlusions in the most efficient and timely way, okay? So why upright the molars? Um, good reasons are you would like to have that force distributed down the long axis of those teeth. Um, you would like to try to decrease tooth reduction if you're gonna do a bridge or use them as an abutment. Um, you would wanna to try to decrease periodontal um, and complex prosthetic procedures where you're trying, if you don't do that, um, where you have to do um, bridges where they have the, the non-rigid abutments there and they kind of slide in and then you have the potential risk for teeth sliding out of that slot. Um, you wanna increase the durability and stability of restorations. You would like to eliminate retentive areas, especially for maintaining teeth in the long term, right? So tip molars are classically very difficult. And um, you would like to try a lot of times to improve some sort of alveolar contour there, especially if you're ultimately gonna plan on putting in some sort of implant. And a lot of times it's crown to root ratios that you're trying to improve as you upright those. So and this is really the question. If you think about A and B, um, you're going to try to upright that molar. And the slide is um, the A and B part is from Prophet's book. So what I want you to notice is that as you upright that molar, you're going to get some extrusion. It's not a pure rotation. And as you do that, you're gonna to need to equilibrate. So I think one of the key pearls from this lecture is that as you do that, you need to inform the patient that you're going to be doing some enamel removal on that tooth. And that can be beneficial for a number of reasons. One for you, because it won't be the only tooth they're hitting on. But also for them, it changes the crown to root ratio. So if you have a really, really tipped molar, um, in fact, there was a good study that said up to uh, like 75, 70 degrees, you could upright those molars. But the more tipped they are, the more likely you're going to end up needing uh, not only equilibration, but um, some sort of intentional endo, intentional root canal. Um, but again, I, it's not a bad thing. It's just you want to let the patients know up front. And most of the time, as you'll see in some of the other slides I show you, as you upright those, it doesn't always give you the attachment um, um, improvement that you would hope for. And so reducing the crown to root ratio is a huge benefit, okay? Um, the other question is if you have both, are you gonna try to upright both? And if you can upright, can you close the space? Those are really the three main questions that I think you have to ask and um, try to resolve with your team and who's gonna do what. And I think the key is to try to be very realistic in the ideal in treatment time for this um, older patient. So 
um, sometimes you also want to consider the incisors. And why do I say that? Um, I'm going to show you, you may need some extra anchorage. So if you need to get to the incisors, that's going to be um, a problem. Sometimes it can change the position of the um, incisors, especially if you're going to try to close that space and put an elastic chain to bring those together. It may pull your anchor unit of those three teeth off. And if you're attached to the midline, um, uh, you're going to pull that off as well. Um, anchorage requirements are hugely more important if you're going to try to close the space. Um, so the amount of space and the condition of that ridge are, are really important. So if the ridge is very knife shaped, um, not wide enough to accommodate the roots of the teeth, um, you will need some sort of bone grafting procedure in um, either with the implant or um, you may in fact benefit, uh, the patient may benefit from having some bone graft after you upright the tooth, even if you're going to um, not place an implant but do a bridge. So keep that in the um, back of your mind as you do these. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of scenarios going easier to harder. So um, it's much easier to distal tip the tooth and upright it and plan for a bridge or an implant. So that would be the second pearl I would offer you. Try not to get into this and be a hero and try to close these spaces. It's really, really tough orthodontically, and I'm not sure it really benefits from uh, the patient that much. Um, and I'll show you an example why. Um, be careful about you know the bicuspids moving and changing. They will, even though you have them locked into as an anchor. Um, and again, the more severe the tipping is, the more extrusion you're going to end up needing to equilibrate off. So if you see and be there, um, that molar's uh, got a fair amount of equilibration, and ultimately you may need a crown to. Um, resolve that. So um, those are all things to warn the patient ahead of time, and I would do that almost as a routine. The last picture on the bottom there is just the typical kind of mechanics. So you could, once you have your anchor unit on the lower um, three bicuspid, um, both bicuspids and the cuspid, then you could put a sectional wire, and it's just pretty easy to visualize that as you lift that wire and hook that onto that anchor unit, those three teeth ligated together, that you're going to um, get that tooth rotating kind of like a clock arm, clown clock or clockwise, um, but you will get some extrusion of that. If it's um, close enough and you're going to um, try to um, bring that close, you may be able to get some more flexible wire. This is a twisted or braided wire. There's also nickel titanium wires, which is lots of um, metal allergies, uh, metal, not metal allergies, metal alloys that we use in orthodontics. And they have different kind of flexibility. So that may be another option if the space is close enough for you. So mild tipping usually doesn't require a lot of special mechanics. You can get that done. Um, you can use some super elastic wires, even um, lighter open stainless steel wires, and you can also use some coil springs. If the tooth is far enough away and you're not going to close the space, you can still use a coil spring to kind of push them apart. That's a really good, um, efficient way to do it. And I've made a note that you should be able to get that done. Typically, if you're going to open the space um, and distal tip that, you should be able to accomplish that in about like eight to 12 weeks. So about three months. Okay. Um, and if you're going to end up trying to do two molars and tip those back, open up a space, you probably can get that done in about six months. But again, remember, you want to make sure you let the patient know that you're going to need to relieve the occlusion or equilibrate that. Okay. So that's a really, a really important aspect. Here's an example of using a push coil spring and then uh, that's just a wound kind of spring, just like it sounds. And as that uprights, um, you can push that back. You can see even on the diagram, though, that the bicuspids and the cuspid are a little closer together. So there's going to be some action-reaction 
even if you um, bond just for an anchor unit, you're going to get some movement there. So it's not only that you may equilibrate the molar, you may end up equilibrating depending how things interdigitate on the bicuspids to keep that um, cusp tip um, fossa kind of relationship. Okay. Here's an example where we ended up using some extra um, anchorage in terms of that lower wire. So, um, you know, without having to get into tons more brackets and braces, which patients aren't going to appreciate, you could tie those two cuspids together with a wire glued in behind there. And it doesn't have to be perfect. We understand you, you know, don't do this um, consistently. So just as long as you get some contact there, it's going to be a short-term kind of solution to get you some additional language. Okay. Um, let's see. okay, the more severe you have, um, the more rigid the wires you want to think about, and the more mechanics you're going to have in terms of um, like metal, different kinds of wires. So um, once you get into this, uh, right where I have the black arrow, you can think about. Um, you can slide, you know, you may initially start with a lighter flexible wire that's hooked between the um, first bicuspid and the cuspid. And then as things get lined up, you may be able to go between the bicuspids. Um, so that's another way you can get um, some additional rotation there. That molar is going to extrude. So that, like I said before, the molar tip, uh, the more tipped it is, the more it's going to extrude and likely um, increase the um, likelihood that you're going to need some sort of endodontic procedure as part of that. Okay. Um, you can also try these um, kind of mechanics as well, and that is using um, springs. <clears throat> I always think about like springs just um, in a simple way, and that is that they just increase the length of wire that you have in there. So, um, if you're a fisher person, if you've ever gone fishing, you know the tip of the rod or the, you know, when you're fishing is very flexible because it's got some length and the longer the rod is, the more flexible it is. So it's kind of that um, analogy that I use. I point out in B, they have the wire cinch. That means, can you all see that that end of the wire is bent? So that's not going to allow that molar to slip out the back or slip distally as it uprights. So you're going to be forcing that tooth. That's why it has those little um, maroon arrows on the root or on the gingival side there. You're going to be forcing those roots to come mesial. Um, just it's going to take a long, long time to do that. If you're going to try to do those kind of mechanics, closing space you're going to be pushing the nine to 12 month kind of time frame to get that done. Even though it's not terribly tipped, it's going to take a lot of mechanics. It's going to take time to get that. And the more, um, the more impacted or topically um, tipped, like in letter D, you're going to have to first disengage that from the distal because often those teeth are locked underneath the, um, distal curvature of the bicuspid or the crown. It's, um, it really is kind of like an ectopic erupted kind of tooth. So um, using that kind of spring is very, very efficient and helpful to disengage that. And then you can go to some of the other kind of mechanics to um, finish operating those teeth. So to bring the point home about why my recommendation over the course of my um, career has been most of the time it's better to upright the tooth and plan for an implant or bridge is this. So this came out of um, Dr. Prophet's book. It took them 36 months, three years of treatment to get that on the bottom. And I think all of us, um, whether you practice um, general dentistry or not, would agree that the periodontal status around uh, those lower first molars is not great. And I would even say that um, it's probably worse than when they started all this. And actually, we have some, uh, we have a case now in the clinic where we did this and um, we follow patients for two years. We follow the protocols of uh, our American Board of Orthodontics, and she's 
back in the clinic after two years and she um, has tremendous mobility on those molars. It's a case of very similar to this. And we're gonna be retreating her to, um, we're gonna take out both molars. They're not paradigmally hopeless, but they're not gonna make her um, happy and they're not gonna last another um, 10 years. So we're gonna retreat her and plan for implants in that space. And if you look in the top, it would probably have been better to think about just uprighting that um, molar and doing a couple implants in place of the first molar there. So, so keep that in mind. I think that, you know, that's a lot of treatment. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, long term, that's any better than having uprighted just the second molars and planned for an implant. What to do once you finish, you're going to need to retain that. So like I said, once you complete that, um, you would like to hold that um, either with the appliances you have, and uh, you can use kind of a rectangular wire to do that. You can put that little tip so it goes towards the gingival. So um, you typically need to hold that for a couple of months and allow the um, you know, alveolar bone to kind of fill in. DDL to kind of get back to its normal um, size and thickness. Um, if they're going to go longer or you're planning the implant, then you may want to choose the lower, um, which is a bonded wire. I also would like um, you to consider using a rectangular wire. If you do a round wire with like a loop there, um, you want to put some little circle bends on the very ends of that you're bonding to the facial bone. Um, bicuspid in the molar. Um, typically, you want to be off the gingiva, right? Because if you're doing surgical procedures for either bone grafting or putting implants, you're going to get some tissue swelling. So you want patients to be able to maintain that. So maintenance is an important um, aspect of this um, because you're going to end up waiting for things to heal up, especially if you're doing bone grafts and implants. Uh, let's go to the next. Um, possibility in terms of adjunctive or limited kind of treatment. You can think about posterior and anterior cross bites. Um, a simple way to do a posterior is to just put a brace or some sort of hook on the lingual one tooth, buckle on the other, and the patient wears a rubber band. Um, you are going to get a tremendous amount of extrusion on that. Um, my experience has been also that you'll probably need some equilibration on those especially on the lingual cusp of the upper, because um, it's just going to tip those two teeth, if that makes sense. Um, but you should be able to get that done in a month or two as well. Patients are really consistent. Um, they eat with them, sleep with them, um, change them a number of times a day. Usually we recommend about three times a day in our office, our clinic. Um, so in a couple of months, they can get that corrected if they're end on kind of thing. Um, if they have a full crossbite and you're trying to do that, you may need a retainer to help um, disclude the um, rest of the teeth so you can kind of jump that over, we say. So keep that in mind. If you're doing the anterior on the left there, know that when you correct that anterior crossbite, you're going to have a height difference, right? So my experience has been that um, once you get that done, then if you can have the patient you know, wear the retainer at nighttime, or if you're using the liners to program in the extrusion there so that you can get that incised ledge evened out with the other thing. And, you know, liners are probably the preferred choice method to do that. There's a number of companies. You could also do it in-house kind of thing. So um, where you take a model and reset that tooth and use um, a pretty flexible material, you should be able to get that done. Um, usually it's relatively quick with a um, couple of months. And then, um, like I said, you want to maintain that, um, especially if you're doing a removal, so that that tooth has uh, and place a window in the liner or some sort of hole in the liner so that tooth has a chance um, to erupt on its own, which has been my experience that that happens. So, okay. How about doing extrusion for um, fractured or carious um, lesions that are going down into the cervical part of the root? Um, or if 
you need to have, you know, the endodontist needs that because they need something to grab onto. Um, you know, true, you can grab onto the gingival, but that becomes pretty painful postoperatively. Um, and you want to consider, you know, those fractured teeth that you're going to keep. Um, they have good root lengths, so you can avoid the cost of an implant for patients. Um, or if you want to bring teeth down and reduce um, vertical defects and make those more horizontal, um, I've done those in my career. So this is a good way to do that. Um, you've got some partial braces. Um, you can use the wire. You don't have to do all these fancy loops. Um, you can also um, plan to just bracket some more teeth and um, extrude with very light nitide kind of wires. Extrusion happens really, really fast. So um, about a millimeter a week. So um, that's a very helpful thing because um, an easy way to do it. Um, what else was I gonna tell you? I wanted to tell you also though, there are some considerations to do for the root length. So as you think about this crown to root ratio, um, this is a good little clinical tip. So if somebody comes in and they busted off their root, or busted off the crown right at the alveolar crest and they have a long enough root, um, know that you're going to need to rough that tooth about four to five millimeters. So why so much? Because you're going to need about two millimeters for the furl, and I'm going to show you some slides of that so that you have enough to grab onto with the crown. And you're also going to need a couple millimeters for biologic width. So, um, so that'll help you. If you got a rough um, a tooth and it has a very short crown, it may not be the best long-term solution. It may be better to just sacrifice that and plan for an implant or a bridge. Okay. Um, the other thing about forced eruption is that the bone is going to come with it. So a lot of times on really healthy patients, um, that bone and gingiva um, will need some sort of post-orthodontic like recontouring, I mean, need a gingivectomy, um, some sort of fibrotomy, something to um, get that normal um, gingival architecture. So that's the other thing to keep in mind when you're doing something like this. So you'll see in this clinical slide here that that's exactly what happened. You know, they were able to bring that tooth down. Um, and when they needed their biologic width, you can see their uh, amount they needed after the posting course so they could end the crown on uh, two structures. So um, keep the emergence profile is always a concern when you have a smaller root diameter, um, length of root in terms of the crown to root ratio and maintaining that um, normal architecture and biologic width of two millimeters. So those are all the factors, um, number factors that you need to consider before you attempt this. Okay. Um, sometimes we've done, I haven't done a ton of these in my career for um, ridge development, um, but sometimes you'll do this like an enforced extrusion and orthodontic extraction. Um, it does save patients money. Most of the time, it's not the cost. It's that they have other medical um, issues that um, they just don't tolerate surgical procedures real well. And so it can be very helpful to do, um, do these. When you do this procedure, you need to, you know, as that erupts, you need to keep a collaborating that crown. Eventually, that wire is um, going to need to go underneath that bracket. So um, right now you can see um, tooth number nine is um, partially ligated. There's a steel tie there. We call that a steel tie where it hooks on. And then as that tooth continues to erupt, um, because it's bonded to that crown or enamel, um, I think it was mostly crown, you can then put that same wire underneath there. So it's nice. It's an easy movement. There's not a lot of, um, as long as you use a light nitite wire, there's just not a lot of counter things that happen with it. So it can be a very, very nice procedure for um, elderly patients and that have other compromised, medical compromises. So. Um, finally, we're gonna talk about anterior alignment and that is to help with either diastema closure 
um, small laterals that you're going to restore and bond. Um, it's nice to have, if you're going to do those kind of procedures, a diagnostic setup. So um, if you're using a liners, most liner companies um, will facilitate um, you kind of planning that out digitally. Um, you can always take a snap, the alginate or a model and uh, reset the teeth just so you can plan how much um, bonding you're going to need and where um, is very helpful. Okay. Um, so uh, this was a case from um, our clinic and uh, she was treated orthodontically and then had some relapse. I like the middle um, picture, clinical picture, because I think that picture is worth um, the price of what you paid for this. So when you're thinking about what options are available for that patient, if you tip them back and have them bite together and look at that amount of overjet and overbite, that'll give you um, the clue what you're able to do. If you're able to retract those, or if you're able to slide those together, um, both require different amounts of overjet. Um, in this case, um, she had plenty of overjet and we were able to bring those together and back. So uh, that's how we closed the space. We chose mm, um, a fixed retainer on the lingual um, as opposed to trying to do any sort of periodontal procedure. My guess is that, you know, the frenum was part of the problem um, driving those teeth apart. But if we, our concern was if we did the periodontal problem um, and tried to resolve that, we would end up with a black triangle. So um, that was the solution we picked. Um, and it worked out well. Sometimes you have this situation where you had the tooth and it was broken off early in life and people went through life and now they have, you know, kids are done with college and they want to restore those anterior and you have the short clinical crown because of super eruption. So um, if you remember back to the um, slide where I said, you know, force levels, to intrude a tooth um, is probably easiest with some sort of fixed appliance because you have some more torque control or you have a greater degree of tip control. Um, and certainly you can appreciate my comment that if you're going to try to do this with the liners, it would be helpful if you could do that, um, lengthen that tooth, even a few millimeters um, pre-treatment, because it gives you a better handle on trying to intrude that as well. Although I will tell you, aligners are not great um, at intruding teeth. That has not been our experience in the um, clinic. So fixed appliances, you can get this done relatively easily. Um, there's lots of ways to control for it. Um, and it's a very, very nice, um, precise procedure. Um, once you have that intruded, there's not, um, you know, a lot of other, um, you know, necessary things. You can certainly take things off. You can temporize it. Um, you know, doing a cosmetic kind of bonding on there. You can hold it with a lingual wire as a permanent retainer until um, you and the patient are ready to do the, you know, permanent restorations. So there's a lot of possibilities, and then the um, far left or far right slide to you, you can see the restorative treatment that was done. Very, very nice result. So your other option I was going to mention, if you don't do that, is um, certainly you could send, you know, looking at the picture that's labeled D, you could certainly think about doing crown lengthening um, when you have the cost then of the perio procedure to do that. And then the other drawback, I think the biggest drawback um, I found when I practiced general dentistry was the emergence profile, right? So you're um, then going to be trying to bond or do the crown to a smaller diameter portion of the root and trying to keep that um, gingival architecture symmetric on both incisors becomes a really um, a challenge. So extra cost, extra restorative kind of challenges if you um, choose to do crown lengthening on that. And also you think about like crown to root ratios depending on how um, much was fractured off. Those all start to become um, problematic. Here was a case where we closed the spaces. 
um, and then bonding was done to um, his final restorations. Um, I think you can appreciate, you know, there was not a lot of overjet to begin with. So really it's, um, there's no way other than space redistribution to uh, manage that. And then they use the permanent wire. That's what I was talking about, a lingual retainer, a permanent wire to hold those um, teeth together. So, okay. So that kind of is what limited treatment in my book kind of sums up. I think it's really operating posterior teeth is most um, common. Um, that's why I spent the most time on that. Hopefully I impressed upon you the need for a collaboration is um, possible, um, probable, um, depending on how tip the tooth is. Um, you also have some ideas about cross bite correction, anterior and posterior, and a couple methods to do that. Talked about some extrusion, and finally, anterior alignment with some sort of intrusion for pre restorative kind of treatment. Um, there's a couple articles that I put on here also that are very helpful, interesting. Um, in terms of the orthodontic world, we're using more of these mini screws to help do that kind of movement on the molars. And when you're able to use mini screws, it's more absolute anchor. Um, so we find better success in trying to rotate the tooth and um, intrude it. So um, that is the focus of most of the current philosophy. Although I will tell you many times it does not improve the perial as the example I showed you with the Panorex before and after. So uh, that's a picture from the Trask Ranch. It's a family I knew when I was living in South Dakota overlooking a portion of the Cheyenne River bed. So any questions? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, you can um, access your questions um, in the Q&A box, and you will find that on the bottom in the control box. Okay. On the bottom of your screen. You can Thank just you click. very much. Yep. And can I, do I just answer live? Is that the best way to do it? Yep. So you click okay. answer live after you read the question, and then um, you can click done answering. Okay. All right. So um, the first question is, why is more force required to move perial compromised tooth? So uh, it's actually, I showed you that um, it, I did not do a good job explaining it. So what I was trying to say, it's not more force required to move it, but if you use the same force levels, that is, if you use the same wire sizes on a periodontal, compromised tooth, you're going to have fire, far greater force levels. Even 20% um, could be detrimental to the tooth in the periodontium. So if you have a periodontally compromised person um, that you're working on, you would want to use lighter um, wires than you normally would. Okay. So typically in the example we used um, for the molar uprighting, that base arch was a 1925 stainless steel. So um, if those were periodontally compromised um, and you were not the best bonder or you thought things, maybe you go to an 1825 stainless steel or some sort of alloy um, to keep those forces lighter. Um, question number two, um, how long is the treatment time for molar uprighting? So in general, I think if you're uprighting one molar and opening the space, you should probably be able to get that done in about three months or so. It's a relatively fast procedure, um, which is good for patients that um, are moving on. If you're trying to upright and close that space, um, I'm gonna say you're gonna be in the regular, you know, 12 to two year kind of thing, although it could end up being a three year project if you're uh, not careful or trying to do too much. Question number three, can you use TAD to do molar uprighting? Absolutely. So, you know, currently, um, as orthodontists, we use TADs to help with anchorage. So um, either directly or indirectly, there's a number of ways to do that. 
depending on the clinical um, situation. And um, that requires a little bit more planning on placement, um, but it resolves some of the anchorage kind of demands on teeth. Uh, question number four, like the presentation illustrations, are you um, provide us with a PDF? So I believe Joe said the thing is recorded and um, I'm not sure how it works, but you will have access to review the lecture for X amount of time, I believe, okay? Uh, why do you think it's hard for aligners to intrude teeth with such a small force needed to move them in the direction? So I don't think it's that hard, but it's hard to control them. So most of the intrusion force is gonna be um, unwanted tipping, so to speak. And so when you just have part of the crown and you're trying to manipulate that little um, crown and keep your root going in a parallel intrusion kind of direction, we find that um, very difficult to do. And I think it's what I was trying to say with having a um, larger crown, if you could do that, pre-aligner that would give you a little bit more control. Uh, next question, can you use a retainer to close the diastema? So I had another C course using elastics on a retainer. Is that correct? Absolutely. There's, so for an anterior diastema, you can do a lot of different ways. Um, and a retainer is a very nice way to do that. Okay. So depending on how much space you're going to have, but just like the previous question about um, aligners, it's going to be a tipping mo um, movement. So um, if you um, have more than a couple millimeters of space, as you tip, for example, the two central incisors together, that's going to leave you with an uneven um, incisal edge. So then you have to think about how are you going to resolve that incisal edge? Are you going to do some enamel plastic to even that out? Is that tip of those two incisors going to be um, acceptable in terms of aesthetics? If it's not, then um, you may need some fixed appliances. And remember in the lecture, I said one-to-one -one, um, anchorage. You could do that and keep your roots parallel, and that would um, help keep your incisal edge parallel. So that might be a reason to do um, some limited treatment with fixed appliances with braces as opposed to the retainer. Uh, next question, do you find relapse on intrusion extrusion common when seeing patient back in the future appointments months or a year later? So this is an excellent question. So I have not found that, but I have other colleagues and I've had, uh, I'm, I know I've seen at least a couple of case reports where people have done this, right? So they've done the extrusion and then they went ahead and placed the crown and they found that with um, time, um, the tooth has intruded some. And so there's no occlusion on that tooth. Um, I don't think there's a, ever been a really great study why that happens um, so that you could predict um, in a, you know, a scientific method. My experience has been um, when, uh, if you don't give enough time for that bone to heal up, so you need to hold, once the tooth is extruded, then you need to hold it for a couple months for that um, bone and periodontal and all that to kind of fill in and get back to the normal size. Um, that's when I think you typically see that happen. On the um, intrusion, not so much, because once you have the tooth intruded and you place it into occlusion, either with restoration, any um, like extrusion from, you know, relapse would be an extrusive method or um, movement. And so that would um, necessarily mean that it'd be in some sort of hyper occlusion and um, just not have seen that happen or reports of that. I'm curious about an appropriate, uh, next question was, I'm curious about appropriate cost range for, instance, separating molar and closing diastema. So 
Right, so this gets into you know whether it's cost effective or not for um, you doing that. So um, I practiced um, as an orthodontist in private practice. Um, I would say molar upwriting in our when I was in private practice was somewhere in the range of about 2,500, but that included full records. Um, so you can kind of gauge that. Uh, diastema closure, geez, I think you gotta, you know, think about your cost with aligners or appliances, um, and then figure out what your time is gonna be. Um, you know, most orthodontists are used to um, fixed appliances and can get that done relatively fast. So, you know, I always put the cost of records in there and then add um, what your, you know, treatment time per visit kind of thing. So I would say diastema closures are gonna be, you know, typically 12 to 1800, depending on what you gotta do and how you're gonna retain them and hold them and um, a lot of what ifs, but those are kind of general ranges, I think. I'm always curious about the, uh, oh, so, um, next question is, is correction of a scissors bite involving premolars possible with adjunctive orthodontics? And if yes, how can that be done? Um, so if it's unilateral and more than, um, you know, you got premolar, so I'm assuming you're thinking multiple teeth, um, you know, typically if you're going to just do the two bicuspids, for example, let's say everything else is normal um, buccolingually and you have two premolars that for whatever reasons you want to correct, then I would suggest that you do um, one at a time. And you could certainly put like a lingual button, kind of like that one example where I showed the two molars. Um, you could put some um, braces on the lower molar bicuspid up to the canine. So you have four teeth there just with a straight wire and they'll have a hook on the brace and that person could wear a rubber band to cross that over uh, one tooth at a time. So I wouldn't be too greedy as I tell the residents many times, just you know, be, um, take one bicuspid, get that corrected, and then go after the second bicuspid. So that way you don't tax your anchorage too much. Um, when you intrude a tooth, what happens to the bone and the gingival levels? Do they follow the tooth or remain in line with the adjacent um, teeth? So typically, um, what you'll find is that as you intrude, this is an excellent question, okay? So typically what you find that um, you will be able, the bone will stay about the same sometimes because it doesn't, it's limited, if this makes sense, by the CEJ. So sometimes you'll get a little bony creep um, and that's doing like massive molar intrusion. Um, and the gingival will um, be, double that amount. So if you get a little creep of the bone and you get a lot of um, gingival um, excess, it'll look like half the tooth's been intruded. So typically in my practice and in what we do in the clinic, we just um, let that resolve. And then um, if it's dramatic, you're going to need to refer them for a perio or um, some sort of almost like a crown lengthening procedure to get that back to the normal um, contours in normal because it's not only that the tooth is um, you get the bone kind of creeped up on the tooth but you'll also have some thickening um, of the bone as well as that goes into the alveolus if that makes sense. Uh, correction of scissors by involving pretty much possible I think I answered that one. I think it's possible. Um, so I'm going to skip that one if I could. Um, how prevalent is adjunctive treatment compared to comprehensive treatment in the general practice? Well, that depends on what, you, what uh, Bill, that just depends on what you want to do. So um, uh, my recommendation is, you know, never to go beyond what you feel comfortable doing in terms of skill. Um, but I feel really, um, you know, having practiced general dentistry, um, we, I did some of these and it was always under the um, 
I don't want to say direction, but under the the um, guidance of the orthodontist. And so it's always good to have that relationship so that if things get out of hand, you have a, a, a buddy to kind of help back you up and get you back on track, so to speak. Um, I would say if you're going to do these kind of things, you don't want to take the really tipped tooth. You want to kind of start out with something easy. Um, and then my other point that I tried to make is try not to go after base closure. I mean, unless it's really obvious that you can get this two millimeter tip molar um, base closure. Um, if you're trying to do um, a major tooth molar as your first one, it's going to be a disaster and then um, you won't want to do it. Um, so keep that in mind. Where did you live long? How long? What's the reason why I'm playing reply? I was in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, so I appreciate that question. Um, and I lived there a long time, the longest time I lived anywhere um, in my career. So I was there over 20 years, and uh, we were in the foothills of Rapid City, so it's a beautiful place. I appreciate that. Uh, next question is: Is there any way to increase overbite along with space distribution. Patient does not have an open bite, but just one mill of overbite. So absolutely, you could do some extrusion. So you can either with a liner or fixed appliances. Um, and again, if you're gonna do this as adjunctive treatment, I would say kind of like the last couple of photos, um, just bond upper cuspid to cuspid and then uh, either bond the upper central incisors a millimeter or so more gingival with the bracket, and that will give you the extrusion, uh, increase the overbite. But um, you have to remember, I showed you that picture where the head was tipped back so you could see how much overjet you had. So if you have some overjet, you'll be probably fine. If you don't have any overjet and there's tight contact, like that other case I showed you where they redistributed the space and did the bonding, um, you'll have to make some sort of provision for um, trying to do that. So if you're trying to, this question often is part of um, anterior aesthetics trying to follow a small, smile arc. So in comprehensive orthodontics to do that, we often intrude the lower incisors to get that um, space to be able to do that. If you're not gonna do that, then uh, not have lower appliances, then you're either going to need to equilibrate the lingual of the upper incisors or the incisal edge of the lower incisors. So um, keep that in mind and how that would look and how, you, you know, if that's something you think is appropriate to do. Uh, what kind of cost an upright treatment? I think I addressed that, you know, especially with molars, you're going to be in the um, you know, 2000 to 3000 range. Uh, should we extrude a broken front tooth due to a fall to achieve the symmetry on the front teeth? So if you, um, to answer that question, you um, need to look at, um, you may achieve incisal edge symmetry, but are you going to compromise the gingival um, symmetry? That's what you got to look at. And so I would say, um, front teeth are important. Um, if you smile and see the gum line, um, I'm older, so you don't see any of my upper teeth hardly. If you have a young person and they smile big and see that, um, you know, CEJ, um, and that's going to be a different length, that's going to be unsightly. So um, they um, are, in general, not going to be happy with that. Uh, to reiterate, we are looking for a biologic width of two millimeters, furrow of two millimeters, and biologic width of one to one after extruding tooth uh, to crown it. Correct. I think that's what you're looking for. So I, I put in there five millimeters just to give you, you know, if you have somebody and it's broken off right at the alveolar crest, you're going to need to extrude that tooth about five millimeters. Okay. So by the time you do all your other uh, measurements, you can look at the length of the root, uh, the root, see if it's worth doing, okay? What kind of success or lack thereof? Have you seen an upright in zeros and clear? Oh, so I would say um, it's on the lack of uprighting. Um, uprighting molars is hard with fixed appliances. 
I don't want to say it's impossible with clear aligners, but I have not seen that case yet. So um, remember, clear aligners are really great for tipping. Um, so um, yeah, I just, uh, it really, I'm sure there's cases out there, I just have not seen them. So I, I it's not something I would attempt with clear aligners. Let's leave it at that. Um, how long would you need to stabilize upright mm, tooth? Does upright in cases causes anterior open bite? So yes, very good. I appreciate that uh, question. So <clears throat> I would say like um, other kind of adjunctive orthodontics, you need to stabilize things for at least a couple months afterwards. So um, two to three months is probably um, adequate. And yes, if you um, upright that tooth, that's exactly what you'll start to see. If the patient starts to complain about, you know, the bites off and things, those are signs that you're going to need to do the equilibration as that happens, okay? It's not um, going to get better unless you use other kinds of mechanics like um, previous questions asked about pads and using those kind of intrusive mechanics to try to intrude that molar. Okay? So that's starting to get into heavier duty orthodontic kind of um, forces and movements. Okay? Um, are there any age you'd opt not to do a phrenectomy? You briefly mentioned the dark triangle. Yeah. So, um, okay. So in my career, uh, I can still count on one hand, and so this is a 25 plus year orthodontic career, okay? And on one hand, the number of times we've done the phrenectomy. So in general, it's, um, it can be best resolved by, from bringing those teeth together, um, it's a really tough spot if you end up with a dark triangle, um, in older adults, you're going to have those issues. So if you've ever practiced general dentistry, there are better um, matrices now available to try to get normal um, contours for that. But it's a really tough area to work in terms of restorative. And um, so if I can avoid that, just it's just me, I try to avoid that. So I would rather not do the phrenectomy not run the risk of having a black triangle, and then um, I would rather put a permanent wire retainer to hold that. Uh, next question, are there any considerations with upright and molar that also has a provisional crown? Um, I hope your provisional crown is good. I'm not opposed to doing that if you're gonna upright the, I mean, I hope your provisional crown is gonna stay on for the course of treatment, I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, I hope you're not going to, you know, if the space is large enough, I'm hoping you're not going to try to close the space um, because that's going to take you a lot of time usually. Um, so if you're uprighting on a provisional crown, I think that'd be okay. Um, all right, same precautions like everything else. You know, you may ultimately need some sort of endo if you're going to now upright a provisional because you've already you know, whacked off some of the occlusal surface. So, uh, next question, what resources are available to learn more about the specific landings and or meetings procedures in the office? So, um, I appreciate that question. Uh, Joe Peterson at the University of Minnesota and I have talked about this, so depending on the success and uh, interest in this, we've talked about adding a part two, which would include some sort of um, type of dot and um, you know, wires, and we could like give you kind of a hands-on kind of um, uh, portion to this program. So um, to be to be announced on that. I don't. Um, you know, there's various ortho courses given around the country by um, various universities, things like that, um, but nothing specific to. Um, and you get Invisalign, of course, they market to um, everybody, including patients directly. But um, so I, you got all those options um, to think about. Uh, next question How much concern do you have for root resorption and extreme upright molars and how often do you monitor 
So typically, so that's an excellent question actually. So my big point of saying the force on the intrusion of the incisors and making a, um, a point about the uh, periodontally compromised teeth is that those force levels start to get up um, high enough for root resorption if you go beyond those um, forces. Usually on molars, it's not um, so much of an issue. Um, have I seen it? Yeah, I've seen it. Has it happened to me? You bet. Um, in, uh, radiographically, you could monitor those by taking a progress PA, I would say, at three months. But usually by three months, you're going to be kind of in and out of there if you're not you know, trying to do um, uprighting and protraction. So I keep hitting that point because in the course of my career, I have found that it's usually more beneficial to upright, accept the space that's been um, going to result there and do an implant or a crown. So a um, short amount of treatment like that with those kind of forces um, usually is not an issue. Uh, next, you had have used the liner to upright molars where there's mesial crown tip by designing biomechanics. So the pivot point is center of rotation near the apex. <clears throat> so yeah, that's the problem, right? It's hard to get an attachment that's going to work well to upright those molar roots. So we have um, on our staff, adjunctive staff, um, a really proficient um, person who is on the line teaching um, program. And we've done, um, she's done four bicuspid extraction cases. I mean, it's really um, tough. Like I, you can tell those cases um, and that's a bicuspid. So now you're asking to upright a molar, which is, you know, way off from a normal position. And um, I just don't think it can be done very efficiently. So to me, part of this is um, the efficiency of treatment and trying to get in and out um, Again, remember our patient pool that we're gearing this for, our older folks, um, you're trying to make things better, not perfect. Um, if you think you can um, improve it with an aligner and it's a few degrees it's gonna make it for you, great. That's not been our experience in the clinic um, in my hands as well, okay? Uh, next question, for upright and molar, what mechanic has worked best? Not not using an ink. So if you're not going to use other teeth, then you're going to need some sort of TAD, a temporary anchorage device for if you, um, I mean, you need some sort of other anchorage to um, hook that long lever arm. If you remember that slide with the long arm and it clips onto that uh, anchorage unit of the bicuspids in the canine you're gonna need something like that. Um, sorry, I missed your answer for this. <laughs> What's the best, um, I'm on to the next question. What is the best way in terms of retention for posterior crossbody in adult testicles? So I would say once um, you have that posterior crossbite corrected, um, you could use um, anything. Usually the occlusion is gonna help hold that together. Does that make sense? You got, you know, buckle, on the upper um, overlapping. Um, if you're gonna, my preference, I like Hollies. I think the acrylic's a little stiffer on that. Um, you can make it the Holly so it doesn't come across the occlusion in that area. So you can maintain some of that. So my preference has always been the Holly. So, uh, so uh, what is the ideal time, age timeline for crossbody correction in children? And what are the modalities for that? Okay, so this is getting outside of um, adjunctive orthodox, but I'll answer it. So um, typically, um, the current philosophy is that if somebody has a crossbite, um, sooner rather than later is more appropriate, especially if they have a mandibular shift. So if the patient child is shifting off to one side or the other, um, as soon as they're able to, in terms of maturity, um, accept that kind of treatment. So in general, we find it's like the seven or eight year olds are can tolerate that. So, okay, next question in line for molar intrusion. 
yeah, it's like Duma. Uh, so um, that has not been what we have found. So when you are an orthodontist and you take a cephalometric x-ray, that's the side of your head and you trace that out. And then when you finish and do another cephalometric x-ray and trace that out and put them on top of each other, we do not find molar intrusion um, from uh, aligners. Um, it could be tracing error and maybe we get a millimeter or so. Most of the time when you see bites closing, what um, the tracing show when you superimpose those is you find there's extrusion of the incisors, both upper and lower, which have closed the bite. So uh, next question was the prognosis of orthodontic treatment for a 50-year-old. Uh, it's good for a 50-year-old. I'm in my 50s. So I think it's good. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, I think at that age group, it's really a conversation you need to have with the patient, like what they want. I would say most 50-year-olds are not excited about being in braces. So um, adjunctive treatment is really important because um, they often want um, aesthetics, but they're looking for kind of good enough to keep, you know, the teeth looking uh, reasonably well and keeping their set of teeth until they leave this earth. So um, keep that um, discussion has got to be part of your initial um, plan of what you're going to be able to do or what they want to have done. Uh, next question, Michael, have you ever worked with clear, correct, and Invisaligners, your opinion? Yes, I have worked with both. Um, uh, to be, I, I like to clear correct for political reasons, um, professional reasons, all that kind of stuff. But both work, both are acceptable. So, and there's other companies too. In the university, we also use um, a number of um, ortho RX, you like self made aligners. So, that's also a possibility if you choose to do some of this um, and want to do in-house aligners, I think those are really um, great cases. So the girl I showed you where we brought those together, that was done in-house at the university. So, okay. Uh, next question. Did you answer the one about the ideal age timeline for crossbite correction? I did. I missed that. Could you repeat? <laughs> All right, I'll repeat it again. So the ideal crossbite is not adjunctive usually, but normally it um, if you have a crossbite on children and they uh, have an asymmetric bite, that's they're biting off to one side and you can see that. When you look at them straight on at their chin point, you can see their chin is off to one side. Uh, we would like to do that as soon as possible. And then soon as possible usually relates to how cooperative, um, how willing they're able to do that. And usually that's going to be seven or eight years old as the soonest. Uh, next, how much concern do you have for root resorption extreme uplighting motors? And do I think I answered that already? So, um, not so much concern, and you could monitor it radiographically. But if we're operating um, in three months, um, I, you know, you're probably going to take whatever happens happens at that point. If that makes sense. So. Uh, next question, when uprighting a second molar distally, better to have a regular size brackets versus mini brackets professionally? Okay, so um, I don't think it really matters um, what size the brackets are as much as the slot. So I would try to encourage you to be in 22 slot because you can put in a 1925 wire, which is really stainless steel, which is rigid and uh, that's stiff, it's strong. Um, and so that's a really good anchor. It ties those three teeth together. Uh, and I've only, for the bonding material, I've used <clears throat> orthodontic, um, 3M makes great bonding materials. Um, so we use Transbond XT, it stands for extra thick. They also make a Transbond LR, which stands really for lingual retainers, it's more flowable. So if you were gonna do this as a one-off and not part of your regular routine in your practice, you could use any uh, flowable um, 
composite has the bonding material for the brackets, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, next question, can we use teeth which already have crowns as anchors? Absolutely. And does the bonding brackets work well damage on a crown? No. So, um, so you are going to have bonding issues to crowns. Um, I found the Zer the uh, Bruxer crowns like uh, they're the worst to try to bond to. It's almost impossible. So in those cases, you may have to use a band. So if you remember from a couple of those pictures, like on the molars, there was a, a band, a silver ring that went all the way around the tooth. You may have to do that as part of your anchorage unit, okay? Um, when you're finished, to answer your second part of your question, you will not have any damage, but sometimes on the porcelain, um, as you clean, you'll have a little dull spot. So just keep that in mind especially if you're going to do some sort of extrusion on the anterior, um, you're, you're doing the anterior extrusion, they already have a crown and they broke off the other crown and things like that. So, okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you. I hope it was worthwhile. Have a good night. Anonymous, one last one. Um, we have two 55-year-old patients who has multiple malaligned teeth to his congenitally missing teeth. He's willing to go through orthodontic treatment to align teeth. Do you think it's possible? Absolutely. What a success rate. Um, very good. Along. So <clears throat> sounds like if you're missing multiple teeth, in our clinic, uh, we are mm, almost like 50-50, approaching 50-50. That is adults versus children in our uh, orthodontic clinic in the um, center of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And when you have multiple missing teeth, those patients almost always are at least a two-year process, so that'll help you out. And um, they are successful. Um, the planning is the, has to be in conjunction with the restorative dentist, whether it's a prosthodontist and or a um, general dentist who does a lot of fixed um, pros. And a lot of times they'll involve some sort of periodontal um, treatment as well as part of that. And the final thing I would add is that you more than likely should advise your patient that they'll need some of those temporary anchor um, kind of things, like these temporary implants <clears throat> that we use um, for gaining some additional control as we're moving. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you um, and your questions. Hope to talk to you again soon. <laughs>